Freedom is under attack. The Pike Committee is investigating the CIA in Congress. The Church Committee is investigating the CIA in the Senate. America has one last chance to beat the Soviets. Angola, wait what? That can't be right, Count. Yes, that's right. Jonas Savimbi is the key to all of this. The future of the Cold War rests on him winning in Angola. Stop this! I'm done peddling your propaganda. I quit. I tell you I quit. So this guy, Jonas Savimbi, made it into Black Ops 2 and he has this boss execution of an MPLA soldier. Oh damn, Rick! That guy got all- Shut up, Morty! You don't even know the half of it. The CIA propped this guy up. Yep, exactly right. But you'd be forgiven for thinking, well, what on earth was the CIA's interest in Angola of all places? Okay, Vietnam was at least kind of next to the Soviet Union and China and North Korea had already fallen into communist hands then, but Angola is just so far removed from the epicenter of the communist earthquake. So it's helpful to start with some context. Now, Portugal was the colonial overlord of Angola and during its reign, there were two main groups opposing them. On the one hand, there was the MPLA and on the other, there was the FNLA. Both were what would be considered left-leaning and both saw independence from Portugal as their main objective. At the risk of angering people by not delving into the nuance, think of one as WWE SmackDown and the other as WWE Raw. Now, seeing where the tide was going with decolonization, America cautiously backed the FLNA led by a dude called Alvaro Holden Roberto. When Angola inevitably would become independent, America wanted it to be on their terms. Now, as this was happening, America was also providing military aid and counterinsurgency training to the Portuguese forces led by dictator Salazar because they were a key NATO ally in Europe. So with America playing both sides in the Angolan struggle for independence, the USSR supported Roberto's enemy, the MPLA, arguing that Roberto would help the Congolese warlord Moise Chambert in the execution of the democratically elected prime minister, Patrice Lumumba. You can learn about that topic right here. A victory for a Soviet-backed regime would also see the Soviets stake their first real claim of influence outside of Eurasia. Now, it wouldn't be an African proxy war without Mao Zedong entering the ring, and he supported a third force called UNITA, which roughly translates to the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola. And lo and behold, a man of the hour, Jonas Savimbi, was the leader of this third force. Now, it is important to note that Savimbi heaped praise on Mao for winning the Chinese Civil War, but criticized him for the great leap forward in how he ran his economy. Again, these three groups were not divided along ideological lines, but more so along tribal lines. Even the CIA director, William Colby, conceded as much when he said, they are all independents, they are all for black Africa, they are all for some fuzzy kind of social system, you know? Without really much articulation, but some sort of let's not be exploited by the capitalist nations. Now, by the 1970s, China had gone through the Sino-Soviet split, but were yet to be firm military allies with the US. Remarkably, when Colby was being asked by Congress about the nature of US activity in Angola, he was asked why China supported UNITA. His response was, because the Soviets are backing the MPLA is the simplest answer. Congressman Lee Aspen then said, it sounds like that is why we are doing it, to which Colby replied, it is. And so from 1969, Roberta was kept on a $10,000 annual retainer to oppose the Soviet-backed MPLA. Now, in April of 1974, Salazar had been dead for four years and his successor, Marcelo Catano, was deposed in a coup by left-leaning Portuguese military leaders. The new regime declared an end to the Portuguese occupation of Angola and in an agreement in 1975, the three movements agreed to form a transitional government with elections to be held at the end of the year. So that means Portugal can now play against Angola in the World Cup? Well, yes, Ronaldo, but there were much bigger issues going on than just that. At lost, Mr. Mitchell. I'm gonna Piers Morgan. Good luck with that. South Park and Chris Rock have done Meghan Markle jokes, so he'll be talking about that for the next six months. So a few weeks after the transitional government agreement was reached, the CIA was authorized to pass $300,000 to Roberto and the FNLA for, I quote, various political action activities restricted to non-military objectives. And then two months later, they attacked the MPLA headquarters, gunning down 51 unarmed recruits. This then led to the full-scale Angolan civil war, and with China and America now on good terms, UNITA and the FNLA merged to form a united force. In response to this, and probably also to Mao sending assistance packages to the FNLA, the Soviets started arming the MPLA and the Angolan civil war was now just a proxy war. Roberto and Savimbi were backed by China and America to take down the Soviet-backed MPLA. Now, I won't go through the whole Angolan civil war, Kings and Generals does that stuff better anyway, 
but I will hone in on the US's support of Savimbi's coalition forces. So they made their first major weapons shipment in July of 1975, about four months after the war began. Their close ally in Zaire, now the Congo, Joseph Mobutu, also helped train the FNLA and helped the US fly between Zaire and Angola to do supply and recon missions. The CIA also directly financed British mercenary forces to fight against the MPLA, and Roberta was using CIA money to recruit many more mercenaries, particularly from South Africa. Of particular note was the mercenary George Callan, who once killed 14 of his own men for cowardice and was believed to have killed 170 Angolans. The FNLA said he was just as likely to have killed them as he was to have killed the enemy, and he was executed for war crimes afterwards. The wartime propaganda machine was also running at full speed. Uneda would often feed them information which was republished without question. For instance, a story was run that 20 Russians and 35 Cubans were captured by UNITA, but that simply wasn't true. It is also worth adding that Cuba were aiding the MPLA as well. So what was America's endgame in all of this? Well, we get a bit of an indicator when Savimbi put out feelers to the MPLA regarding a negotiated settlement. The UNITA FNLA coalition was in a bad position as the MPLA firmly held the capital Luanda, and so Savimbi went to the table but was admonished by the Americans for doing so. When MPLA representatives then also reached out for a negotiated settlement, America was very clear. Soviet influence out, US influence in. You see, this was all an elaborate ploy to try and win the Cold War. By the way, Savimbi is such a divisive figure within African history, and so I'm keen to hear your verdict. Is Savimbi either a hero, villain, or victim? Pick one, and let there be a comment war. America also encouraged and solicited South African involvement, and because of their apartheid regime, this meant that very few other African forces were willing to join Savimbi's coalition forces. By 1976, Congress had caught on to the fact that the CIA and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger had been lying to them about the nature of American intervention in Angola, and they cut off funding to Savimbi and Roberto, one of the few times that Congress has stood up to American intelligence. So with congressional funding cut off, Savimbi's coalition looked poised for defeat. However, Kissinger still encouraged them to maintain their resistance and personally promised UNITA further funding if they did so. And then Kissinger said, we can fund you. <laughs> and guess what? He didn't have the money because Congress had cut it off. <laughs> Exactly. And to make it even worse for Savimbi, he lost 600 men while waiting for this money that was never going to come. In an effort to justify this, Kissinger later wrote, Angola represents the first time that the Soviets have moved militarily long distance to impose a regime of their choice. Again, this was really just a tribal dispute that had now been blown way out of proportion. To quote Daniel Moynihan, the US ambassador to the UN, The communists would take over and go on, will thereby considerably control the oil shipping lanes from the Persian Gulf to Europe. They will be next to Brazil. They will have a large chunk of Africa. And the world will be different in the aftermath if they succeed. Again, with all due respect, this is Angola. Angola. But I think we have reason not to take America at face value on this one. You see, there's another player in this game who I've only mentioned once, Joseph Mobutu, leader of Zaire and America's most important client in Africa because of the Katungan uranium reserves. Now, the rebels in Zaire actually came from Katunga and they were on good terms with the MPLA. A UNITA FNLP government-backed coalition would weaken the rebels in Zaire and hence strengthen Mobutu's position. But with congressional funding cut off to the coalition and the MPLA holding the Wanda, it was clearly them that were the governing party in Angola. The FNLP dissolved in 1978, leaving just Savimbi as head of UNITA and head of the resistance. In 1984, a confidential memorandum was smuggled out of Zaire that revealed that the US and South Africa had met in 1983 to discuss the destabilization of Angola. Washington claimed it to be forged, while UNITA's Washington representative refused to comment on the issue. A month after this alleged meeting though, the UN Security Council censured South Africa for destabilizing Angola and endorsed the MPLA's right to receive reparations from them. There was only one country who abstained from voting, America. Savimbi would then continue the resistance against the MPLA until his death in 2002, surviving six assassination attempts and having been reported to have been dead over 17 times. Because of this, many refused to accept his death when he eventually did die in 2002. Throughout the whole process, America supported him, with Reagan and Bush Sr. even doing so quite publicly. What's most tragic was that the three major powers in the initial Angolan civil war were not all that ideologically different. 
They all wanted independence from Portugal, they were all somewhat left-leaning when it came to economic management, and the Angolan soldiers weren't scholars of Marxism and weren't particular about the differences in Marxist thought. It was a tribal war. But because of America's involvement in prolonging the conflict for the most far-fetched strategic purposes, it not only killed many innocent Angolans but set back their development as a nation by decades. Take its next-door neighbour Namibia for example who got their independence much later in 1989. Namibia's GDP per capita is over double that of Angola's. There's no way that should be the case, especially considering Angola's rich oil and gas reserves. But that's the exact issue. From 2002 to 2015, the Angolan economy recovered brilliantly, but after 2015 the boom was over and the Angolan economy could barely capitalise on that for a decade before going back into contraction. Had they had four decades of the oil boom, of which the majority of Angolans were robbed of by the Americans constantly propping up Savimbi, they would have been one of the leading African economies. I'm talking third probably based on the size of their oil and gas reserves, but now they're 17th. But the CIA are far more nefarious than just that. And to learn about the time they aided Sahado in killing up to 2 million Indonesians in flat out genocide in the 1960s, click here.